Today, I have the pleasure to welcome Dr. Paul Bilziki, practicing dentist from Toronto. Dr. Bilziki has kindly agreed to work with us on several posts on the management of some of the complex cases he has had to manage over 38 years of, practice, of clinical experience. However, today he is here to share with us his own philosophy on the profession of dentistry, how he became a dentist, how he acquired his knowledge, how he solidified his clinical experience, and why dentistry for him is a passion and an amalgamation of art and science. Dr. Belziki, thank you for taking the time to share your valuable experience with us, and welcome to CDA Oasis. Thank you very much. So before we go to the presentation that you kindly prepared for us, um, can you tell us why this topic is important for you, and why did you decide to speak about it? Um, why I'm here, I think, is part of it is addressed in the presentation. But another part, I just found motivation from a, an experience where a patient of mine had gone off to dental school. She came back. Um, she shadowed me while she was in dental school. And I said, if you have any problems, once you get out, I'd be glad to help you. So she started working at another office. And... She called me one day, I've got a problem, and we're having difficulty figuring out how to treatment plan this. Sent me the pictures, and it's of a, an older person, uh, failing teeth in the upper arch, need to take all the teeth out and make a, an immediate full denture. And they're at a loss to know how to proceed. So I said, fine. First things first, take, take a stone model. She said, uh, they, don't have they don't have the capability to pour up a stone model. Okay. No vibrator, nothing? Nothing. I said, okay, well, if you had a stone model, you then make a custom tray for it. An acrylic custom tray, and you trim this thing down with the electric handpiece. You've seen me do it here. Uh, they don't have an electric handpiece. They don't have acrylic uh, trimming burrs. So I said, well, what goes on there? Well, it's a spa dental clinic, all right? Spa dental clinic, fine. I said, look, I can't do this over the phone. Come in, we'll sit down together, and I'll write out all the steps that are required because I've done this, so I know instinctively what to do. And in our discussions about mentoring younger dentists, I guess that's the motivation. It all just came together, and that's why I'm here. Thank you so much. So can we go and see the presentation? With pleasure. We'll give it a whirl. I've titled this presentation, The Art and Science of Dentistry, Philosophical Reflections. This presentation is a result of conversations with Shiraz with regards to initiating a series of posts on OASIS where the insights of seasoned clinicians are presented. So what follows are my personal opinions and observations and they're based on treatment cases spanning 38 years. I document all my cases extensively before, after, and particularly during treatment. So I can back up anything I say with photographic evidence. I'm not funded by anybody and therefore beholding to no one other than a loyal staff and a loyal group of patients that have honored me with their trust over three and a half decades. So here I am in my uh, operatory, and you can readily see I'm, I'm well seasoned. And I was educated in the pre-computer era, and that's something important for you to know, uh, because there's a divide between the group before computers and after computers, and we can call this old school and new, uh, new school. It took me a while to get used to the moniker old school, but like grandfather, I've kind of grown into it. So studies show that there's differences in how we learn. There's differences in how we ask questions and how we prefer our answers packaged, how we come to knowledge, and also how we judge what is valid knowledge. And it's not just me, it's not just my opinion. There's some other academics, educators, this one a professor of, lingu of linguistics, an author of a book, Words on screen, the fate of reading in a digital world. It doesn't have anything, anything to do with dentistry, but it does have to do with language and learning, and it's the relationship between technology and language. 
And she found as a result of merely reading text on a computer screen, students may develop the mentality that I'm studying for a test, this is a piece of text, or this piece of text is not going to become part of who I am. It's only a matter of convenience and students won't absorb every word as compared to reading a traditional physical textbook, even though it's the same text. So this also begs the question, where is knowledge stored? Now we're all familiar with the various sources of knowledge and at, at the top of the pyramid is knowledge from authority. That's what we learn at school. It's approved lectures and refereed literature. And we call this evidence-based and it's our hope that it's accurate, honest, and bias-free, recognizing that no human endeavor ever is. And here we look towards the methodology of science to point the way. After that, we've got knowledge from the marketplace. Here you can lump in self-appointed experts and gurus. There are for-profit endeavors. There's institutes and associations where certificates and citations are granted to those that merely participate. You can add in trade journals and lower down the list, manufacturers promotions. And of course, my least favorite, the internet where there's fostered the misconception of deep understanding with information retrieval. And that's been termed exosomatic knowledge, knowledge outside of the self, outside of the body. Now, it's not without some irony that I'm here using the internet to voice an opinion and pontificate. And I, I know it begs some explanation and it goes something like this. Terry Donovan is a noted lecturer and educator in the States, and I heard him say on graduation, it's hoped that the grads are safe beginners, that new dentists are safe beginners, and that the knowledge needed to practice is safely within you. Somatic knowledge, knowledge within the self. Now there's a difference between old school and new school. Old school, when I graduated, we would refrain from asking questions of a senior clinician for fear of being scolded. What, are you stupid? You didn't learn that at school? At school. We taught it to you, it's in the textbooks. You should know it. You've got a doctor before your name and you don't know this. And the difference, my observation is new school, the questions come fast and furious and the answers are to be packaged nice and neat and if you add in a few emoticons on a blog, all the better. So Oasis started in 2013, and I'm not afraid of computers. I just use them as a tool. As you can see, I'm well versed in PowerPoint, so I know what I'm doing. I just don't look towards the computer for entertainment or knowledge. But I started getting uh, email notifications about this blog, and I never visited blogs. I thought I'd give it a whirl. And there, uh, questions were being asked that were being answered online and I wasn't really I didn't think much of it and my estimation really sank to a all-time low when I saw this question what is the most durable restorative material and in a flash I thought of the ant of this being scolded like what you don't know that are you stupid didn't they teach you that in school were you lazy did you miss that day? I mean, every textbook tells us that gold is the most durable restorative material. It's in the materials textbooks. It's in the restorative textbooks. And here are four crowns. Two are 20 years old, two are 30 years old. And they've been functioning quite nicely in this person's mouth. Second to gold is amalgam. Amalgam would just sit there, take the abuse decade after decade. I can't remember whether I left a comment or not, but even some of the other answers had me scratching my head. But well, maybe they don't teach this anymore. Maybe I'm at, I am out of touch. But I thought, hey, this isn't for me. So I left a message with Oasis. Please remove me from the email list. Because I fear that the next question is going to be, I hear those yellow things just behind the lips and in front of the tongue are the teeth. Is this so? Well, here you can see these crowns have been sitting in this mouth. This guy's a big guy, 
has a gorilla bite. You can tell by the splayed anteriors. And these crowns just keep taking a beating decade after decade. Thoughtlessly, he can go about his entire life with four crowns that have been placed. Well, within a few days, I got a call from Shiraz, who I did not know. And she requested I explain my issues or problems with Oasis. Because they're, they're trying to develop this blog or this, inter, this site, not just for young dentists, but for everybody, old and you. So what are my issues? So I said, well, as far as I'm concerned, the internet is awash with misinformation at best and deceit at worst. Claims are advertisements that are merely disguised as information where the real intent is to attract business. And even if valid information is found, there remains in my mind the confusion of deep understanding with mere information retrieval. As I said, exosomatic knowledge, knowledge that is outside of the self. It's easily found, therefore easily forgotten. It's different than knowledge that's hard fought for, where one must sweat and toil, usually in isolation for a successful outcome which results in that knowledge being ingrained into the self. Somatic knowledge, knowledge that is within you. It's at your fingertips and it's in your gut. You know it when it's right. Now dentistry may be defined in many ways and surely one of the ways is that it's a craft. And this adjective in my mind has been much maligned of late and where I think it should be elevated because it's the art part in the art and science of dentistry. That's a phrase that we're all familiar with. So there's blending of art and science in other endeavors as well, such as the making of a samurai sword. Here, the science part has been mystified to a religious status because the recipe to manufacture these swords predates science. So what better way to ensure the fidelity of this knowledge than to encode it as secret, unquestionable dogma. Several steps are required. Smelting raw materials to produce two types of carbon steel. And those are forged, welded together, and then drawn out into the shape of a blade with a traditional configuration by repeatedly heating and hammering. This is forging that takes weeks. The rough blade is then transferred to a polisher to apply a gleaming finish and a razor edge. And there he's doing it, hunched over a sharpening stone. The blade is then transferred to a handle maker to make these beautiful embellishments. And finally, a woodworker to fashion this scabbard to a flawless finish with lacquer. The entire process takes months. And each one of these fellows must apprentice for a minimum of 10 years before he's considered a master. Why is that? Well, there's a considerable amount of knowledge that must be ingrained into the self. They all share a vision to approach perfection. Guess wrong in any of these stages and all the result ends in failure. The line between dedication and obsession becomes poorly defined. This video focuses in on the sharpener. Um, it spoke to me w because of his words and the movement of his hands. He uses a stick to move a very fine polishing stone millimeter by millimeter along the entire length of the blade, working towards some imagined elusive perfection. The criteria he employs to guide his hands is not found on the internet, nor perhaps in any written text, because they are mental and sensorial images, not easily expressed in words, but here he gives it a try on days of reflecting. Just watch his hands all read, because it's grainy. 10 years of apprenticeship and 15 years since I've been on my own. Having worked for 25 years, it was fine while I was an apprentice. In the 15 years on my own, there's been probably only once that I was satisfied. My goal is to come close to the work of my master, and the other is to sharpen exactly as I imagined it. 
It is difficult to explain, but before I sharpen a sword that I've taken in, I get a visual image. I get an image in my mind of how to finish the sword. I work towards that image, but of course, it is more often that it does not go exactly to the image. This is strictly a battle with myself, and it is not something that is understandable by the customer or other people. Yes, the line between dedication and obsession becomes poorly defined. After some years, I've also had my time for days of reflection, and it goes something like this. On graduation, I entered private practice. I was frightened beyond belief. Son of a tailor, we didn't run a business. Here I was. One second I was student, now I was owner of a business. In my 10th year of practice, I came into an empty office one morning. I opened up the blinds, the sun came in, and I had, I had an epiphany, I've arrived. And I thought to myself, I think you could throw just about anything at me, and I could cope. I would know how to solve it. Having worked for 38 years as a solo practitioner, I have encountered and solved most problems on my own. Here I'm trimming an acrylic provisional for a lower reconstruction. My hands are guided consciously by knowledge of what anatomy is required for proper form and function. But guided subconsciously to perform this task by years of practice. Before starting a case, I develop a visual image of an ideal outcome. I rely on the experience of similar cases I've performed successfully. I work towards that image, and of course, more often than not, it requires great effort to approach that ideal. In the 38 years on my own, there's been a few instances where an ideal outcome was reached with little effort. But most of the time, approaching the ideal requires diligence and some measure of frustration. I try not to get upset when this happens. It is part of the process. This is strictly a battle with myself and is not something that is readily understandable by the patient or other dentists. I hope you can see why I resonated with that sharpener. I fabricate every provisional that I've ever placed, and there's two reasons for that. Firstly, I think I'm pretty good at it, and I truly enjoy the artistic exercise. I'm in the back lab with an electric straight hand piece and a medium sandpaper disc, that's all I use. I'm away from the patient, I can relax and just sculpt away, give the patient time to recover from what I've done to them. But more importantly, in my opinion, the entire restorative endeavor is my responsibility. It's the dentist's responsibility. This is my vision of what is correct. I don't want anybody else's. The criteria I use to guide my hands is a confluence of art and science, and it's totally pictorial. I visualize what is right and work towards that ideal and stop when it feels right. I am certain that if I had to do this a second time, it would be different in some regard. That's the art part. But the important criteria to maintain the health of tissue, stabilize the occlusion, and satisfy aesthetic demands would still be present. And that's the science part. Sometimes it's difficult to know when to stop. And yes, the line between dedication and obsession can get blurry. To use the words of the master sharpener, when I've taken in a smile to make right, I analyze it. And in very short order, I get an image in my mind of how I want to finish it. That image comes more quickly with experience. Going from A to B almost happens second nature. Not because I'm brilliant or anything, but I've lived through it. I know that it's a chain of events that's properly sequenced. Whoops. And here, you can see 
we do our analysis. Speak to the patient. What are your concerns? Do you even think anything's wrong? She's lived with this for many years. I never mentioned it to her. One day she walked in and said, it's time to do something. So I take a stone model, three-dimensional, because I want an organic model. That's what it's called now, or an organic analog. It's, it's, it used to be just a stone model. But I use a stone model that's 3D because that's, I'm working on a 3D organic patient. And this will give me the information I need. It's, it's a touch. It's a feel that I have to have. And I'll work on that case. Don't have to spend too much time here. I'm just using blue block out material, light cured, to try to develop what is she missing? What do I need to put back? And I'm struggling to find out, do I have to involve some of the lower teeth? She gave me license to go ahead and do what you want. After I've worked on it, I obtain a vacuform shell and I use that after I've trimmed the teeth as a guide on tooth reduction. Accurate impressions are obtained. I'm still doing it old school, polyvinyl siloxane in an acrylic custom tray. Even if I had to do one crown, I still take a full arch impression. I'll even layer in, after the impression's taken, I'll layer in some by hand using uh, some impression material on an end of a probe, just trying to block out the margins so that when they pour it up, a technician doesn't have to come too close to that margin that I've refined and possibly score it and not tell me because I trust no one, not even myself. And here I fashioned the four incisors and that's tried into the mouth. I don't go by equations or formula, width to length, what are the golden ratios, etc. I just start carving and after years, I know what's right. When my eye is pleased, then I'll give the patient a mirror and say, this is what I think is right. They give me their feedback. When the two of us are online, I say, fine, go home. You and I might like it, but maybe a spouse or a family member won't. So test drive this for form and function. And after everybody's online and everybody's approved uh, of, of what's, what's been done, stone model is obtained and that's sent to the lab. Make same, make my vision. Don't get, too, or don't, don't get too imaginative here. Just give me what I want. And yes, you have artistic license on the, on the surface texture and making edges more refined. You have that capability, go for it. But be in the ballpark. And then that's cemented in. And pretty porcelain, the aesthetics, the pretty porcelain is the easiest part of this whole thing. I, I almost don't want to be a part of that. I'd rather the patient have the ceramics choose a color. They're far better than I am. But what I am concerned is, is the fit and finish and the form that this will function for a lifetime. I often make this treatment totem pole from start to finish just to prove to a patient. I've delivered what I've promised. First, there was analysis and vision. Then there was making that vision concrete test driving the vision, and then having the lab produce predictable results. With experience, every step must be anticipated, including what might go wrong, because something always can go wrong. If you don't think it can, you're not looking close enough. Dentistry is akin to shotgun making, in that there's the production of functional art, it's the construction of aesthetic tools to exacting specifications in order to survive in a harsh environment. This is the receiver made out of high strength steel and it's the heart of the shotgun. This one is beautifully engraved and inlaid with gold. My hobby is skeet shooting, so that's why I show it here. And I do own several shotguns. Sadly, nothing is beautiful because it, it costs in excess of thousands of hundreds of thousands of dollars. But it must function in a harsh environment. It must survive hundreds of thousands of explosions over the course of a lifetime. If not, with all this beauty, it's a useless piece of junk. As dentists, we too manufacture beautiful tools. They have to be aesthetically pleasing. But they too must be designed and constructed to survive a lifetime of abuse. 
If not, they too are useless. That receiver is milled out of a stock of solid steel. And over 70 parts have to be fashioned and assembled with exacting detail. It's the marriage of old and new. Here, the use of CAD CAM to mill that solid block. It's a spark erosion device that uses electricity to do away with metal. But afterwards, it's old school. Here, an oil lamp deposits a layer of soot that's used as a pressure indicator. The components are fit together, they're tapped in, and then they're disassembled. And a craftsman, using nothing more than a hand file, goes about removing all the high spots, all the interferences, to make sure that it fits as precisely as possible. I mean, this guy could be a good dentist. Just look at his hands, look at him work. It's best that he describes these things in his own words. The most important fit is where the chamber meets the action. It's very important, obviously, when you put your shotgun cartridge into there, and there's a lot of forces going through this place here. There's a very tight seal around the front of it. If you don't have it, you'll get gases escaping, you'll get damage to the action, you'll get damage to your, to your face, all kinds of things if you're not careful. To make sure it's a tight seal, Tom uses an oil lamp to deposit a layer of soot on the barrels. When the gun is closed, the soot should rub off, revealing the shiny steel underneath. It's a good seal. And just to prove it, Tom reaches for his wallet. Face the 10-pound note, begins to face the action, and close the gun. And you'll see that the lever does not move across, therefore the gun is not closed. That's how close they have to be, that's a gas tight seal. That's how close I have to be. That's a gas tight seal. Now, I hope you're not missing the pride, I mean, in his face and in his eyes, that little smirk he had at the end when, he's, when he claims this, because I certainly didn't miss it. CAD CAM will only get you so far. You still require the skill of dedicated craftsmen with a shared vision to approach precision. Managing precision intraorally is demanding as well. And here, these four upper incisors are going to receive crowns. When I pick up the air rotor, I look at these teeth, and I develop an image in my mind where I have to end up. And slowly, I work towards that image. Sometimes when I meet somebody for the first time and they ask me, what do you do for a living? I tell them, I'm a human milling machine. I mill in 3D and in real time. I'm a dentist and I mill teeth all day long. Now I'll tell you, I can reduce enamel just as quickly as anybody else, but working and refining this margin reminds me of that stone sharpener. You have to go millimeter by millimeter along this margin with full respect for gingival contour. I do periodontal surgery in the office, and I think when you do that, you respect soft tissue all the more. And each one of these has to be designed for certain criteria. It has to be thick enough for restorative material. It has to be accurate and smooth, and you can't abuse the soft tissue. And then managing that soft tissue with accurate fitting provisionals. And you know, under high magnification, I mean, Textbooks tell us healthy tissue has stippling, that orange peel effect. Well, it's there for all to see. After everybody is agreed on the fit and the aesthetics, the, the contour, again, stone model and nothing more sophisticated than a pencil line is drawn to tell the lab, this is the length, here's the midline, please make same. And they do. And again, they have their artistic license to certain limits, but the shape is given to them. And we're still not over the goal line. Because if you take all those four crowns and try to cement them in all at once, you may be fooled that they're fully seated. What I suggest is you cement in every other crown permanently. Then you take the middle crown and you try to put it to place. And often you'll find your fingers are telling you it's binding. And the patient will tell you, I feel pressure. 
And when you look at it, you can see this does not look like that nor that. So like the gunsmith, pick up articulating paper because it deposits ink on the articulating surfaces of where it might be too proud. And then you, I take a sandpaper disc, I remove the ink mark in a little bit. And this goes back into the mouth. You can see I've already reduced some of it because you take off a little bit and you go slowly. <laughs> you know, fraction of a millimeter by fraction of a, of a millimeter until you put it to place and your fingers tell you there's a hint of resistance. So I know I have good contacts. I haven't lost that. It goes to place quite nicely. And the patient tells you, I don't feel any pressure. And then the same is done for the lateral. Now that's how close I need to be. It's a microbe tight fit because if it's open, you get the ingress of microbes and your cement washes out then it's no good so this is functional art that must be that, that fits accurately and harmoniously with host tissue to survive the test of time again CAD CAM will only get you so far yes the overlay porcelain is done by hand but the zirconia cores are done CAD CAM so CAD CAM will only get you so far you still require the skill and dedication of craftsmen here, dentist, working in concert with lab technician, with a shared vision to approach perfection. Now, I hope you're not missing the pride with which I present this. I'm, I'm not trying to boast in the least bit. I, this blows me away. Every time I look at this, it, I can't believe how good it looks. Every time he comes in, we j I just stare at it. And this is only possible because of the advent of the high strength ceramics we have. Trying to do this with PFM, it would be a struggle. Um, I do aesthetic dentistry all day, but I don't call myself an aesthetic dentist. And on the front door of my office is assigned Dr. Belzicki's dental office. Because when you walk into the office, it's, it's me that you get. I'm bemused by all the new pseudo monikers for dentistry, all the, new, all, all the newly minted categories of family dentistry, laser dentistry, 3D or digital dentistry, metal-free dentistry, holistic, spa, wellness, and from Oasis, patient-centered, value-based, and a few months ago, we've got a new one, transformative dentistry. And then there's uh, cosmetic dentistry. A focus on cosmetic dentistry because the first bunch aren't worth, aren't worth my breath, because as far as I'm concerned, it's just promotional hoo-ha, uh, where the intent is self-aggrandizement and to give the patient the impression that they're getting something different than another office. But on cosmetic dentistry, back in the day, there was only two types of dentistry, good or bad. Good dentistry demands that we do our best to fabricate durable crowns in the anterior that blend with adjacent teeth and are harmonious with the patient's physiology, psychology, and fiscal demands. Bad dentistry is the inability to do any of the above. It is that simple. Now we're still not finished because a weak link can be, what do we cement in these zirconia crowns with? My entire career I've used polycarboxylate cement and I love Poly F by Kalk, it's, uh, I endorse it wholeheartedly because I can tell you it lasts. But I was told the zirconia substrate, poly F isn't the way to go. Attended a few lectures at the university level and I was told use a resin cement or a resin modified cement, glass ionomer. This by respected academic authorities, by the manufacturer of the zirconia substrate, I hit upon the paste-paste system because it was so easy to use, easy to dispense. It was a no-brainer. When it set, it set hard like a rock. It was like white concrete. You had to chisel it off if you were slow in getting it off. And I found that it was compatible with the pulp. There was no need to etch, uh, which I'm not fond of. Had very few endodontic reactions. And of course, there was the claim of superior performance compared to polycarboxylate cement that it was harder, more retentive, less soluble. 
But in the back of my mind, I knew I really never had any problems with polycarboxylate cement. It was pretty much problem free. But I started using it not only for the zirconia crowns, but cementing in traditional PFM. And after two or three years, a few crowns started to dislodge. People would walk in with this. And this was a very rare occurrence up until that time. And this is a crown that was brought in by a patient. And I'll tell you that this had the consistency of burnt or charred paper, where you would just touch it and it would flake apart. This is when the red lights went off. On removal of what I thought were secure crowns, I discovered wet cement. After 10 minutes, this dried to a weak consistency that was easily flaked away, similar to what the patient had brought in. Furthermore, when I was making temporary crown for this tooth and this tooth, the acrylic had set a little bit too hard. When I went to tug it off, I pulled off a crown that was in the middle. And after it dried, it too had this flaky appearance. This is the typical appearance of removed crowns that were cemented with polycarboxylate cement. And this after 20 years, I may have had to remove it for reasons I can't remember right now, but I'll tell you, you have to take a round burr in a handpiece to grind this stuff out. I'm fond of saying, and I've done this a few times, it looks like the day it was cemented in after 20 years. So I sent these photos to the manufacturer begging for assistance, begging for help. Their suggestion was I try their new and improved in whatever version it was too. And, and I, I've learned to believe that new and improved is seldom better than old and rotten. And there was no acknowledgement that a problem was even present. And this bothered me because I can't be the only person complaining of this. Uh, am I the only one looking? This is my dear friend and patient, Dr. Ursula Franklin. Sadly, she passed away last year, and she was head of the Department of Material Sciences at the University of Toronto Faculty of Engineering. She held a chair there for many years. And she was a patient of mine, and often I would have her come in at the end of the day and I'd drive her home and we'd talk about all things. And on one occasion, I was telling her, describing her the problems I was having with this new complicated cement. And she said, look, it's not my area of expertise, but when you take a crown, you mix up this cement on, on a pad, this complicated cement, you put that on the inside of a crown, and then put that crown into a mouth. She told me, there you are on the chemical high wire without a net. Nature has an insidious way of undoing everything man-made in ways not possibly replicated in the research lab. As a careful clinician, you must hold your everyday experience in higher esteem than that reported in journals, from academics, and most certainly from manufacturers. She's written several books about knowledge of the hand, knowledge acquired by the hand, trying to make people aware of how modern technology affects how we come to knowledge and what we consider knowledge. And finally, she said, please endeavor to share your knowledge with younger clinicians. And this is another reason why I'm here, because of this pioneering feminist, tireless educator, and authentic mentor. And it's to her memory that I would dedicate this presentation. And I hope I do her justice. Doing a little bit more digging, I found from authority research uh, researchers at the university level, the biodegradation of composite resin polymers containing ester bonds by human and bacterial esterases. Now I'll guarantee you, I can't pick out in the, the ester here without a label, because I haven't looked at a biochem book in a lifetime, and I'll forget it as soon as the slide is finished. But more to the point, most commonly formulated dental resins are methyl methacrylate based polymers that contain an ester group. Ester groups are cleaved by water in a process termed hydrolysis. Glass ionomer is hydrophilic and attracts water. Ester-containing resin is hydrophobic and degraded by water. So mixing the two phases together, making that complicated chemistry, may be problematic. 
And Dr. Franklin was right. Nature is insidious. Hydrolysis of the composite resin produces breakdown products that affect the karyogenic behavior of bacteria in terms of its growth and virulence. Something called matrix metalloproteinases, originating from the dentin, I assume the pulp, and oral bacteria accelerate the rates of decay at the restorative interface. Finally, I had scientific reasons for what I was seeing clinically, and I am a strict clinician, wet fingered and all. So on knowing, it's the confluence of art and science. The art of dentistry is performed with hands guided by a mind that conceptualizes a desired outcome. And that knowledge has to be contained somatically within the self. And within the three and a half pounds of gray matter between our ears. And it's an interplay between the two. It's the science that we learn and it's the trial and error that we gain by our hands. And I'm fond of quoting Dr. Simon Weinberg, an oral surgeon and educator here in Toronto. Good judgment comes from meaningful experience. But often meaningful experience comes from bad judgment. It's trial and error. So I urge the younger clinicians, don't push the envelope too hard or too far. Endeavor to make small mistakes, small errors, that you can recover from. Success has been compared to a chain where the strength of that chain, the ultimate strength relies on some weak link. Some of these links are contributed by the patient, their psychology, are they cooperative, will they listen, their physiology, their age, um, systemic problems and their bacterial load. These things are often beyond our control. But what we do bring to the table, our contribution, is our knowledge, our skill, our methods and materials, and how we guide the lab. Good dentistry, as opposed to bad dentistry, relies on efficacious knowledge to identify and manage the weak links to achieve long-term success. How we choose knowledge, therefore, is crucial to that success. Choose your knowledge sources with care and a good deal of skepticism. Don't believe everything you read. Don't believe everything you see. Going to these trade shows and seeing all of these, comp all of these uh, computers and lasers and milling machines, you can make high quality, long lasting dentistry without going further into debt upon graduation. And that's the science part. Perform the art of dentistry with a commitment to excellence. Going back to this slide that I showed earlier, there's a treatment maxim that I, I guide all my treatment by. Every patient is deserving of an accurate diagnosis. And every patient is deserving of treatment performed to the highest standards. Is that, you know, would we want anything less if we're sitting in that chair, if we're on the table? either in dentistry or in medicine. I mean, we want it, we want it done right, not once in a blue moon, but each and every time. That has to be the commonplace. So in conclusion, I would like to thank the Oasis Group for granting me the resources and the honor of an electronic soapbox from which to pontificate. It is not my intent to lead or sway the minds of others. One convinced against their will is of the same opinion still. If I have ruffled some feathers, so be it. For most of my career, I've flown under the radar, and I'm more than happy to continue at that low altitude. If a young dentist is positively influenced by my efforts, then I would be personally rewarded if they too thrive in our profession with honor and a commitment to excellence. But I'll tell you, it's a hard and bumpy road. To us like-minded senior dentists, it's my hope that you feel vindicated if your choices of methodology and philosophy of care resonate with what has been presented here today. We're still relevant. Be cool, doing it old school. <laughs>